Welcome to the Energy Education Workshop. My name is Sydney and I'm going to be guiding you through today's session. Um, I'm from an organization called Green Learning, which we'll get into in just a minute. Uh, this workshop is all about energy efficiency, conservation and renewable energy. Specifically, how can we educate others about these concepts and engage them in this climate action? Before we jump into things, I do want to take a minute um, and first just acknowledge the land that we're on. Um, so I was really lucky this morning. Um, I got to go out on a walk and take this beautiful picture of this gorgeous landscape that we're in today. Um, and even on my trip over here, I had the opportunity to speak with numerous people in the airport and on the plains about the Indigenous peoples of this region and how they are so entrepreneurial and just inspirational in the way that they manage their businesses. Um, and I want to just acknowledge the enduring presence, past and future. Um, and hopefully we can keep this uh, as we go throughout the cultural land camp. I also wanted to share a piece um, from where I'm from. So I'm from the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, the colonial name is Kitchener Waterloo, Ontario. And this is a um, Anishinaabeg artist named Luke Swinson. Um, and he created this piece after speaking with his partner about losing a bit of hope about the climate future. Um, so he was feeling as though we're not doing enough and we're not doing quick enough. We're not doing it quick enough. And I'm going to speak from his words here um, and just read off of his quote um, of when he created this piece. So he said, it can't be a coincidence that as the earth is trembling, indigenous voices are being heard and indigenous ways are being reclaimed. I created this piece to represent this resiliency and the hope that I wouldn't allow myself. And I think that really sets us off on a positive path for this workshop because I think the fact that you are all here, you're all working towards clean energy and a sustainable future means that we're all in this together. Um, and we do need hope and we have that resiliency and we can move forward together. So in addition to being uh, a beautiful piece of digital art, I really loved the meaning with this and I wanted to kick off the workshop with it. As I go throughout the workshop, um, you will notice that there are a number of QR codes on the slide. So if ever you see something and you go, I would love that resource, I would love to check out that website right now, I want to check out this artist, feel free to pull out your phones. Uh, you're welcome to use them throughout the session. Um, if you miss anything, not to worry, I will be setting this out so you'll have access to all of the resources anyways. Okay. So I mentioned I am from Green Learning. So in a past life, I was actually a classroom teacher. So I taught mostly grade one French immersion, uh, but a combination of everything from kindergarten to grade eight, English and French. Now I work for a national charity called Green Learning. So at Green Learning, we, uh, our mission is to engage and empower students to create a better future. And the way that we do that is by creating free online resources and digital tools about climate change, energy, and the green economy. Today, we're going to be going through a number of those lessons, a number of those digital tools that hopefully you can use in the future to help educate others about energy efficiency, conservation, and renewable energy. Uh, we have really one basic but long learning outcome today. So by the end of this session, I hope that you'll have the knowledge, tools, digital resources, and strategies to educate others about energy efficiency and renewable energy. Now, I recognize that I am one person with one set of experiences and one perspective. So I encourage you um, and invite you that if you have stories, resources, or anything else that can help build on our collective knowledge about these topics, please share it with the group. Uh, if you're not comfortable sharing it with the full group, feel free to share in your table groups and we can share uh, as a larger group later. Okay, so don't be afraid to interrupt me at all. Uh, we, can, we can build on each other's knowledge that way. So I like to start pretty much all of my sessions with the basics of climate change, and I would encourage you all to do the same as well. Energy, climate change, all of our systems are extremely interconnected and complex, and this is foundational knowledge for understanding uh, energy efficiency and climate action. So in three minutes or less, I'm going to explain climate change and feel free to use these strategies. So this is language that I would use with grade fours, but it's also language I would use to explain it to my parents. So it is very versatile. So essentially, we have this big, beautiful earth and surrounding our earth is a blanket of gases. OK, and those gases are made up of anything from water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide, etc. That that blanket of gases helps to facilitate what's known as the greenhouse effect. So sun, rays can come into Earth. Some of those are absorbed by the Earth, some are reflected off back into space, and some of them are re-radiated as heat. 
Now, that blanket of gases that we talked about acts to trap some of that heat on Earth. And kind of like when you, you know, stick your leg out of the comforter and it's the perfect temperature, that's the same thing about our greenhouse gases. They keep a really perfect balance of heat on Earth enough to sustain life. Unfortunately, when the Industrial Revolution hit, humans started to create an influx of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So this tipped the balance of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that's like not only putting your leg back under the comforter, but adding an extra blanket on top. So now we're trapping more of that heat on Earth. Now, that's really what explains global warming. But climate change is much bigger and grander than that. All of our systems are interconnected. So you can see um, on the right here, and this is a, a graphic from the United Nations, that there are a number of different uh, systems from the hydrosphere in the ocean to the biospheres on land. Um, and all of these are interconnected. So changes in one, changes in our atmosphere, are going to impact changes in the rest. So melting ice is going to mean rising sea levels, which is going to mean bigger storm surges, which is going to mean ex more extreme weather. So all of these things are interconnected and build on each other. And they actually create a tumble effect. So kind of like a snowball rolling down a hill, the, the further it goes, the bigger it gets, and the faster it goes, that's what's happening here. Luckily for us, solutions do the same thing. So as they start to gain traction and gain speed, they get bigger and they get better and they get stronger and more people involved. So we're, we, we have a, a situation here, but we know, what, we know what to do. We have the solutions and we're ready to move forward. So I would encourage you to always start with this as your foundational knowledge. Now, a lot of people think that there's some type of climate debate. There is no debate. Uh, it is not something that we entertain as a debate, and I would encourage you to do the same. Have you ever run into folks who are not sure about the science behind climate change? Uh, maybe they have one of these myths in their mind, such as, it's the sun. Climate, the climate's changed before. It's going to change again. It's really not that bad. This is a resource that you can use to help you. So this is called Skeptical Science. And Skeptical Science will actually take you through each one of these different climate myths and explain to you how we can debunk them using science. Now, some of you may be familiar with the energy pyramid, which is really what we're gonna focus on today. So when we're talking about addressing energy, so climate change is caused by the influx of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And collectively, the world has decided that we need to limit that warming and we need to reduce our emissions through the Paris Climate Agreement uh, and so many other different policies. So there are three basic ways that we can address uh, energy. Uh, first, energy conservation, so behavior changes, energy efficiency, so that's where we're actually changing the technology that we're using, and then system change, so looking to transition to renewable energy. We're gonna talk about each of these three, and I'm gonna give you some strategies to teach others about them. So, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, this is what's called a watt meter, or a power meter, a handheld meter, okay? And what it does is it measures the power of a device, okay? So it can be anything. Anything you can plug into this standard outlet, you can measure the power of, okay? I'm gonna measure this lamp right here. So how it works is you just plug it into any standard outlet, okay? And then you plug your device into the power outlet, or sorry, the uh, watt meter. There we go. And I have a nice fancy detachable one. So I'm gonna show energy efficiency and conservation using light bulbs. And the simpler and smaller you can start, the better, and then build up. So this is what we call scaffolding knowledge. Um, so start with the simplest terms, even if you know that your audience already has that. Uh, this allows you to start with a really, really solid foundation. So like I said, I'm gonna start with light bulbs. So I have two light bulbs here. Uh, my first is an incandescent light bulb, so this is glass. And my second is an LED. I don't think uh, I need to ask, but which is the more efficient light bulb? LED. LED, awesome. So what does that mean, energy efficiency? So I'm gonna show you what this watt meter does, and then I'm gonna show you another tool that we can use in conjunction with the watt meter that'll help you interpret this information. So I'm gonna show you uh, just on the camera so everyone can see it. Um, so basically I'm gonna ask you to look for two things. I'm gonna ask you to note the watts, and I want you to note how bright this light is as well. Okay, so you can see how bright it is. Oh, backwards, that's okay. So it's about 58 watts. So you are right on the money, 60 watt light bulb. Now I'm gonna show you the other one and I hope you all noted how bright that light was. Okay, 
So I'm going to plug in my LED. Does anybody want to take a guess as to how many watts the LED light bulb uses? At least half? So you're thinking 30 watts? This is the LED. 17? OK. Now it's backwards. I'm not sure if it makes sense for me to show you. If anybody can read backwards. So it's about 9 watts. So that is a 9 watt light bulb. OK? And I'm going to give you in just a second a chance to go around and test some different devices. But first, I want to show you um, our energy calculators. So these are actually brand new resources, so they have not launched yet. These resources are to help you better understand what does this power and electricity mean. So since we're in British Columbia, I'm going to go ahead and click on the BC calculator. And this calculator needs two pieces of information, the watts of your device and how many minutes you've used it. So let's start with the incandescent. So it was a 60 watt light bulb. And let's say I'm using it for three hours a day, you know, in the evening when the sun goes down. Okay. Now this calculator tells me three pieces of information. First, it's going to tell me the kilowatt hours. So that's the energy that's being used. So what I measured here was power. Okay. So energy needs time. Okay. Second, it tells me my environmental impact. So this is the greenhouse gas equivalent of that electricity use. So we know that creating energy, moving energy, uses, uh, creates greenhouse gases, it creates emissions. So actually this information is from RET Screen, so if anyone's familiar with that program. Um, so that's where this information comes, okay? And then lastly, we have the cost. So this is how much on your electricity bill you're going to pay for that uh, electricity use. Now, the cost does not uh, include base costs for your electricity, and there is some details for each of the calculators down below that further details all of this information if you're interested. So, with this information, we can know a few different things. First of all, this is what you're going to see on your electricity bill, which we'll talk about in just a second, but really what we're going to focus on is the environment today. And so, I'm going to pass out these kits. And inside your kit, you're going to find three different things, OK? So inside this recycled cotton bag, you'll have your own power meter. OK, so these are for you to take home so you can use these resources um, and keep on going. Awesome. You're also going to find a binder. That is an energy education binder. So inside there, you're going to find a number of different activities, handouts, resources that you can use your watt meter with and some of the other strategies I'm going to talk about today. Lastly, you're going to find a solar car kit. So we will finish off the workshop today by building solar cars and really exploring solar energy. So what I'm going to ask everyone to do is uh, in just a second, you're going to come up and you're going to take uh, one kit. So everybody gets this to take home. So make sure you keep all of your stuff in your bag. And I'm going to give you a handout. On that handout, you're going to see this game of tic-tac-toe and a chart to track what you're, what you're putting in. So I'm going to ask you to go around the room, around most of the outlets, I've put some type of electrical device. Go around, test a few out. I want you to open up the calculator. On that back of the handout, there's a QR code for the calculator. If you're interested and you think you'll use the calculator again, what I would recommend is in the very back of your um, binder, there is a slip here. I would slip it right in there and keep it all together. Okay? So you're going to check on the calculator. You can do your province if you'd like. You can do British Columbia where we are. It's completely up to you, whatever you think is most beneficial, or you can test out multiple different calculators. Okay, so you can come on up, grab a kit and a worksheet, and get to investigating. I'll give you about five minutes.
Okay, so now the energy education binders. So what is in those binders? Well, there's a number of different activities and lessons um, that you can use with pretty much any audience. Um, these are a few of my favorites. Um, Speak for the Trees is another one that helps you compare things. So in Speak for the Trees, we compare our impact to what the sequestration potential of trees is. So on average, and this is totally off for BC because you have some massive beautiful trees here, but on average, a tree can absorb about 21 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions per year, okay? So look on your sheet and compare that. How many trees would it take to absorb some of the devices that you measured today? What about the devices that you use? So it's just another way, another anchor to help you better understand and compare and, and use as a, as a, as a, a starting point. This one is probably my favorite in the binder. So this is the home energy audit. So this is a digital resource, but it, I've given it to you in a physical form. So if you ever want to reprint these resources on our website, they're completely free. And what it does is it will take you through how to do a home energy audit. So starting with things as basic as light bulbs, going to as advanced as looking for drafts in your windows and doors. So we'll walk you step by step through how to do an energy audit. Now, this resource is very dynamic in that it can be used in a number of different ways. So whether you're engaging your community and you want to look at one area of your home every single week to investigate, you want to go into a home and do an energy audit with a group, or you want to give this resource out so that folks can do their own home energy audit. Uh, it's really just an easy tool to use super guided um, and it goes through a number of the different things that we talked about today. Um, it encourages folks to make a plan. Now somebody mentioned while we were measuring the watt meters and I'm so glad that they did that this makes me feel really bad about my energy and that was exactly my first reaction and this is where I would bring in the locus of control. So the locus of control basically looks like kind of like a dartboard. So in the center here, we have the things that you can absolutely control. Okay, so that's things like whether or not you turn off the light when you leave a room. Here, in the, the second circle, we have things that you can influence. So for example, you might be able to influence your, um, if you're a renter, you might be able to influence the homeowner to buy more energy efficient light bulbs next time they upgrade. And then you have things that are completely out of your control. So things like how you generate your electricity out of a lot of our control. I would encourage you to stick within the locus of control. Okay, so that means that we're focusing on things that we have the power over um, and that we feel comfortable adapting. Okay, so when we do energy audits, it's not meant to make anyone feel bad, it's meant to become an awareness activity. The more you know, the better decisions that you can make. Does it mean that you can't use lights anymore? Absolutely not. We are bound by the systems that we live in. And I think that's something that's really important. And as you go through talking about energy efficiency and especially renewable energy, I would really encourage you to start from the center and then work your way out. We always want to encourage influence in other areas, but recognize that, uh, that our, our, we do have limits and, and we, we have to stay within those. Now, we do have a number of activities and videos that can help you better understand things like your electricity bill. This is one that is not in your binder, but is on our website. So we have an entire video series dedicated to helping homeowners uh, really understand this information. So to give you an example, this is my electricity bill from last month. There's a lot of information on here that you might not know, but definitely your audience, whether they're students, parents, uh, really anyone, might not know. I don't know if you've ever actually looked at all the different charges that you have, but we have a video that will actually walk you through this information. And I would encourage you to customize it. So if in your community you have one central uh, supplier for your energy, I would encourage you to go through that activity and see where it matches up. Did you know that we pay for the delivery of our electricity, for example? You also pay for the energy that's lost along the way. So those big transmission lines that you see, they lose about eight to 9% of the energy along those lines. You pay for that energy. That gets charged here. There are a number of other charges, such as regulatory charges, which really help to sustain the grid. So understanding these things is empowering because the more you know, the better off you are. And so I would encourage you to encourage folks to look at their bills and to better understand them. Okay, so some of you may have 
looked at different calculators. And I'm going to pull one up again. So we are here in BC. So to use a 60 watt light bulb for one hour, it's about 409 grams of GHGs. I want to compare that to what it looks like if we are in, for example, Alberta. So I'm going to do the exact same thing, 60 watts for 60 minutes. So that's significantly more than 409 grams. Why? Thank you. It is coal and natural gas based. This is 100% dependent on where you generate your electricity, which for most of us is out of our locus of control. But understanding that system is really, really important. And so that is my segue into chatting about renewable energy. So here in Canada, we actually have a really great mix of energy. We have everything from hydroelectricity, nuclear, solar, wind, obviously combustion of fossil fuels, and geothermal, and everything in between. So as I mentioned, we're going to wrap up with solar, so we're going to come back to this in a second. But I wanted to take a minute and talk about the energy transition and how we can talk about the energy transition with folks. So this is the hockey stick model. It's adapted from Markham Hislop of Energy Media. And it's one resource that you can use to explain how the energy transition is happening here in Canada. So um, think of uh, this uh, kind of vertical axis here as adoption. So adoption of renewable energy technologies. So here in the 1990s, we had the innovators, and even earlier so, many of our uh, renewable energy types go further back than that. But really, we had a lot of innovation happening in the 90s, and this was a, a really a big result of research and development funding. So it takes money to come up with these great ideas and see them through. So this really kind of propelled things. Then we get into the early adopters. So these are folks I think we all know when uh, we met our first person that drove an electric vehicle or maybe even a hybrid vehicle. Those are the early adopters. So those are the people who wanted the solar panels on their homes right away. They didn't wait for the masses to adopt it or for uh, kinks to be worked out or anything like that. We are still pretty much in that stage. So we are still in the early adopter stage. Um, so we are very quickly moving away from that. And what they kind of describe is a tumble effect. So very similar how we talked about if a, a snowball is tumbling down a hill, it's going to start going faster and bigger as it goes down. This is the same thing. So once we get past this almost curve of early adopters and we get into the early majority, where majority of people are adopting things such as uh, renewable energy for their homes or electric vehicles. It's going to tumble from there. The more people are using it, the more people who see it, and it's a, it's, it basically it just spreads from there. And what they predict is that once this happens, it's basically a straight shot to full-scale full adoption. Now, will it happen in this timeline? I think this timeline has been adjusted even in the last five years that I've seen. Um, but this gives you an idea of how it will quickly spiral. And you can use the hockey stick model or really any model that displays this kind of uh, trajectory, trajectory that really picks up after the early majority. Now, somebody was asking about whether or not we'll adopt more solar in the future. So this here um, is a really unclear graph of the levelized cost of energy, L-O-C-E. And what this means is that we've taken the cost to install, the cost of materials, the cost of operation for these different technologies, and we've divided it up by the lifetime of that technology. So however long it will last for. That gives you the levelized cost of energy. And as you can see here with solar and wind, they've been drastically decreasing over the past years. And so this trend will continue. It's obviously slowing down as we're getting to be really competitive with other types of technologies. And actually right now, wind is one of the most competitive as far as localized costs of energy. So right now, policy is really, or up until this point, policy is really what's pushed the energy transition forward. It's the government making policies that we need to limit our emissions, making policies that well, we need to implement electric vehicles. But we're getting to a point right now where these technologies are becoming competitive on their own, meaning that the market itself will take over. So things like electric vehicles are becoming more affordable. That means more people are adopting them. So 
As we see these things move forward, we're going to see also an increase in the quality. So I know there, were, there was lots of talk uh, even a decade ago about the range of electric vehicles. Now that's increased substantially and they're competitive with other things. Lastly, about the energy transition, I want to show you this one thing. So this is a prediction based on the policies that have been outlined. Um, so the source is there. Um, if you'd like to look at it, uh, look it up, there's a number of different um, kind of graphs that use the policies that are currently in place to predict what our energy landscape will look like in the future. This is global, okay? So this is based on the world. So as you can see, our use of coal is gonna drop drastically. But things like wind, solar, and even bioenergy are going to jump, they're going to skyrocket. And so we're gonna see that here in Canada as well, this transition happening. Now, a lot of folks rely on things like oil and gas for their livelihood. That does not mean that they don't have a livelihood anymore because those folks are part of the transition. This is not our first energy transition. We went through a transition when we uh, went through the industrial revolution, right? So we went from using things like our hands and horses for energy to using things like coal. We can do the exact same thing. And that doesn't mean that folks are being left behind, but it does mean retraining and reskilling our, our labor force to adopt and prepare for this. Because whether they, they want to or not, this is, this is where we're heading and it's really, really exciting. So that's a little bit about the energy transition and where we're going and how I would talk about it. Again, I would focus on the locus of control and, and just recognizing that for the most part, folks don't have any input in this, but they do have a vote. And recently, Ontario, uh, where I'm from, had a provincial election and we had an embarrassing turnout. And so the best thing that you can do is encourage folks to go out and vote but also empower them with the knowledge of what they're voting on. How can they evaluate these platforms and how they're going to impact not only this energy landscape, but really sustainability in general. Okay. Now the fun part that I'm sure all of you have been itching to get to, we are going to be building solar cars. So each of you in your pack should have a solar car. Now, one thing that's really awesome about these kits is that they don't require any glue, meaning that you can take it apart and put it back together, or you can take it apart and build something brand new. Oftentimes when you're talking about things like renewable energy, it's really handy to have a physical piece to kind of uh, walk through and show folks as you're talking about it. We're gonna do a wrap up in about uh, 20 minutes. We'll come back together. So you have about 20 minutes to build your cars. It's not too sunny outside right now, but you might get lucky if you wanna go out and test them out. I'm gonna be coming around and just chatting with folks, but if you do have any questions, uh, you can just flag me down. Uh, solar cars are essentially just model cars that are powered by a tiny photovoltaic cell, which is just a tiny solar panel. And uh, yeah, the youth get to put them together, play around with them, and it just helps them understand and engage with solar energy. <laughs> I really just want to leave you with a couple uh, parting pieces of information, um, some really just general tips. Um, really my best tip for uh, as an educator is do the best you can with what you have and what you know. Once you know better and you have more, do better. So the, you can only expect to do uh, what's within your uh, locus of control. Um, there are tons of resources out there. They are difficult to find and they're difficult to navigate. So I would highly recommend that if you see an organization that has resources that you're interested in, reach out to them. Folks like us at Green Learning, at Relay Education, uh, and other folks in this sphere from Learning from a Sustainable Future to Green Teacher Magazine, uh, all of us really love when folks reach out for support and we are more than happy to provide information, resources, links to kits, or really whatever that you need. Uh, we work in this space full time. So if you're looking to educate others and you're looking to engage people, 
do not hesitate to reach out. All of our resources are completely free and we are more than happy, excited even to, to support you on this journey. I hope that the kits are super useful for you. As I mentioned, all the resources in the binder are available online. So on the first page, there are two QR codes. One for an energy revealed program. So that's energy conservation and efficiency. And the second is re-energy. So that's all renewable energy technologies. So if there's anything in that binder that you're like, hey, I would like some extra copies of this, or I wanna share that with a friend, you can go online, they're completely free, download them, save them, edit them, whatever you'd like. Uh, I encourage you to customize them. But thank you so much for learning about energy education. I hope it was useful. Yeah. Yeah.